I want to believe, but. Three weeks in and this still entertains me. Three weeks later and I'm still 12 years old. <laughs> One of these days, my I will grow up. My wife tells me it will happen. She tells me it will. <laughs> We've been talking about this. This is our third week now. The very first week we talked about the fact that People sometimes have a distorted image of who God is and how we relate to him. What is our perception of him? What, how do we see God? Who do we think he is? And the first week we talked about the on-demand God, the God that you know you expect to put your tithe in the celestial uh, Coke machine and uh, you, know, you push the right button and you get all your prayers answered and a, and a nice beverage as well. And we talked about how that's a false God. It's not real. That God doesn't exist to serve us. We exist to serve him. Amen? And last week we talked about the killjoy God. The killjoy God. I don't want anything to do with this God of yours because it's nothing but rules, rules, rules. And then we discussed the fact how, no, that's religion. Religion is all about rules. God is all about relationship. How do I know that? Because by paraphrasing John 3.16, I know that he loves me so much that he would rather die for me than live without me. That's some serious stuff there. There's not many of us until we find ourselves in an incredible extreme that will sacrifice our life knowing that it will save someone else's. You've got to be in great extremes to make that call. And it's a tough call to make. God made it without hesitation. He made it without hesitation. That's how much he loves us. That's how much he loves you. He doesn't want to burden us with rules. He wants to burden us instead with the joys of relationship. Relationship so joyful we can't hardly stand it. Dig it? Dig it. Okay. Next week, Pastor Mike is going to talk about the heartless God. Uh, I don't know about this God of yours. How can I follow this God of yours when he allows this to happen, when he allows that to happen, when he allowed the other thing to happen to me? He has no heart. He doesn't care. He doesn't love me. That's a lie from a devil's hell. Pastor Mike's going to dig into that. But today we're going to talk about goosebump God. And this is where we have misconceptions and misperceptions about God really being there in our lives and really being there for us when we never seem to sense him. We never seem to feel anything. Show of hands. Have you ever felt that you've been in the desert, so to speak, spiritually, where you are trying to find God and you just don't seem to be reaching him and you don't feel him speaking to you? It's a lonely feeling, isn't it, in that moment? It doesn't mean that we're alone. It means we're experiencing an emotional response to the circumstances of life, usually. Last time I checked, this was earth, not heaven. What about you? And there will be stuff. There will be stuff. God spoke about that through his son, Jesus, where he said, in this world, you will have stuff. Actually, he used the word trouble, but you know what I mean. Uh, but then he said, right after that, take heart. I have overcome the world. The biggest problem that we have with our own misconceptions and misperceptions of who God is, is that we don't have a grasp of eternity. We still think in terms of this life and this life ends. And that's not entirely true. If that were true, it, would, it could be used as an argument to say that God makes junk. It's defective, it eventually fails, and then it gets dismantled and recycled and some of it's thrown in the trash. That's not how God operates. A perfect God doesn't make junk. Here's the reality. All of us, and all of us includes, all of us are going into eternity. This is not the issue. It's where? Where's your reservation? It's not like there's just one hotel option 
There's two. You really want to make sure you're at the right one. But feelings can lead us astray. Ever been led astray by your own emotions? Perhaps you have listened. You've never been this person. I know this. Maybe some folks in second service, but not y'all. Maybe you've listened to someone like this, or maybe you've heard someone who's dealing with a loss, and they've told you they've tried reading the Bible, but they don't understand anything and nothing seems to happen. Ever heard that? Don't raise your hand. Ever been there? Or you've, you've heard them talking to you, and take note, if somebody talks to you about this stuff, they're putting a lot of trust in you. Listen closely and make sure that you love these people. Make sure to respond with love, which means responding gently and respectfully with the truth. Not what they want to hear, but what they need to hear. Okay? But if you do that with gentleness and respect, 1 Peter 3.15, you're going to leave, at minimum, a seed behind. They're praying. They don't have a sense of feeling God at all. Have you ever felt like your prayers, whack, hit the ceiling? Sure you have. How many prayers does God answer? All of them. Does he have options regarding the answer? Yes, he does, because he's God. He can say yes. He can say no. He can say, not just now. Wait. You know, he's got options. And he has the perfect plan. Having already seen all of eternity, he kind of knows how it should go down. So we don't always get the answer we want. And sometimes it feels like you're not getting an answer at all. It seems as though you are not getting an answer at all. And it, re it creates an emotion that God's not listening to me. I'm, again, I'm all alone. I'm lonely. I want to believe, but I don't feel anything. Goosebump God. I want to believe, but I don't hear anything. I can't see him. I'm not feeling nothing. We all go through seasons of that. There are folks that are living in that season. They are hungry. They know that there's, they may not describe it this way, but they know that there's some kind of hole in their life, and they're trying to fill it, and they don't know how. We need to help them. We need to be their, their, their helpers, their ministers of grace, mercy, and love. That's our job. My job is not to just stand up here and chat with you. My job is to get you all engaged in this task as well. It's my responsibility as one of the pastors of this church to make sure that I'm paying close attention to the second, uh, the second item in our uh, mission statement, which is equip. Because the Bible tells me that one of my responsibilities is to help equip you for works of service. If you think that's a pastor's job, let me, with love and respect, tell you that your thinking is in error. I just made a whole bunch of fans right then, didn't I? You didn't have to agree so quickly back there. <laughs> but the person that's looking for goosebump God thinks they hear other people. But they don't hear them. They don't hear that person. And and you all know some of these other people that hear God. They're the ones that they prayed for good parking at the supermarket and got it. Got a spot up front. They tell you about it. God was so good to me when I went to the supermarket. He parked me right up front. Um, I've been praying for a raise and I got one. God gave me a raise. And he might well have. Uh, my 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 child. My grandchild just got a full ride scholarship and they've got nothing but good things to report. They're on the mountaintop, aren't they? Yeah. Mountaintop's a nice place to be. Not all of us can stay on the mountaintop, can we? In fact, life virtually assures that at times we will not be on the mountaintop. We will be in the valley. And sometimes, I talked about this last week, sometimes in the valley there's a ditch. You're not just in the valley, you're in a ditch in the valley, okay? Uh, then the ditch is full of water, ditch water no less. You're not going to come out smelling good. Ditch water. 
I'm so entertained this morning. It is so good to be with you guys. It really is. Um, I think back just, my goodness, it's only been a couple of years ago when my wife was diagnosed with a couple of heart blockages. And stents were not an option. She was going to have to have bypass surgery. And we trusted God throughout it. We did. And God performed a miracle like he does. I had a very smart person once tell me that doctors can do a lot to you, but they can only do so much for you. The distinction there is you want somebody to do something for you, you want the God of the universe. Because if you're like me, you like it done once and done right. And we trusted God. So were we scared? You better believe we were scared. I was just plain scared. I was scared to death. It greatly improved my prayer life. It improved her prayer life. And there she is back there. That's my gal. That's my gal right there. It's like they yanked 15 years off the calendar for her. She's tiring me out. She's wearing me out. I cannot keep up with her. I'm serious. So, you know, there are great, wonderful stories that we can talk about when we're on the mountaintop. But even, even with the mountaintop, mo mountaintop moments, there's probably a valley moment associated with it. Otherwise, you wouldn't recognize a mountaintop for what it was. If all you ever was on on the mountain, that's all you'd ever know. The reality is the valleys are real. The ditch water is real. So for you, after you're hearing all these wonderful praise reports from this other person, meanwhile, somebody has dinged the door on your car, even though you were parked out in the North 40. You didn't see it until you got home because you got drowned in the rain trying to get your groceries to the car because the wind destroyed your umbrella. You're taking stuff out of one plastic bag and putting it in another plastic bag so you can put the plastic bag over your head. Your spouse didn't get a raise. Your spouse got demoted. And instead of getting a full-ride scholarship, your child or grandchild is being required to take a year of remedial classes at community college before they're ready to step into the regular curriculum. And you end up going, I don't have the feels. You start saying, where's God in all of this? Where is God in all of this? He is. In fact, let me ask you a couple of questions. Don't give me the answer you want me to see. Be truthful. This is a safe place to wrestle with stuff like this, okay? How many of you have ever felt the presence of God? Okay, good. How many of you have felt the presence of God in church today? Do you see the differential? There's nothing wrong with that. We're all at different places in our journey. This is just real life. This is earth, not heaven. If you're one of those who didn't raise your hand and said, I didn't feel God today, don't worry. Trust me on this. He's still present. I'll even go further. I'll say, don't believe me because I said it. Go to God's word. Go to God's word and read about this. You know, do a Google search. Pastor Steve loves the Google. The Google. Do a Google search on scriptures about God's presence. See what you find. I promise you it can alter your day if while you're reading God's word, you permit it to read you. Make it a two-way conversation. When you did sense the presence of God, you might have felt all kinds of things. It might have been a goosebumps moment, literally. It might have been a, a, an, a, almost an electrical shock feeling inside of you. It, you could have cried. It could have been a moment where, where, where in the middle of everything going on in your life, peace just washed over you like a perfectly warm blanket. I've experienced that one. That's why I mentioned that one. I've been there for that one. It was a couple of months after my dad died. 
I was, and you know, moments like this, you know, you remember when it happened. I was behind the wheel, and I was on, uh, I was on 164. I was on the Western Freeway getting ready to go on to 17, and I was having a moment thinking about my dad when the totality of everything that we'd been through for all those months he was in the hospital and his death and everything else just overcame me. And I was just about to lose it behind the wheel. And I cried out to God, and I said, help me. And out of nowhere, I didn't have it. It descended on me like a dove. And I was at peace. Everything was calm. Everything, he, he put my heart in order. It's the most, one of the single most astonishing things I've ever felt in my walk with Christ. I recommend it highly. If you haven't had that experience, trust me, when you do, you will know. And you will tell people about the God who was there when you needed him most. It does happen. God's presence can be something as simple as, as sitting close to somebody you love. And, and the and the emotional experience you get from being in that particular relationship. God is present in relationships that honor Him. It can be something as simple as something on YouTube making you cry. You're having, a, you're having an emotional response to something that has moved your heart. God can be present in something that mundane. There's so many things that it can be. So if we didn't feel God today, like I said, it's okay if you didn't. It's all right. But if we didn't feel God today, why is that? Whose responsibility is that? Is it God's responsibility? You don't have to answer that. Is it your responsibility? Is it the worship team's responsibility? By the way, I cannot even begin to describe for you from a deep personal level what an astonishing joy it is to stand up here and serve with this worship team. Oh my goodness. If you have a voice talent, if you have an instrument talent, and you don't put on your connection card that you might want to consider serving on the worship team. But my question to you is, why not? If you've got that gift, if you think you've got that skill, there is an audition required. It's not just an automatic in. But if you think you've got it, put it on your connection card. God is much more, much bigger than our feelings. God is way more than our emotions. Who has your Bible with you today? Let me see it. If you've got the old school, it's got pages, new school, lots of new school with screens. Great to see them. Thank you. And the reason I ask that right now is because we're going to get into the Word. And I want us, just like Pastor Steve does, just like Pastor Mike does, just like the whole staff here does, we want to be known as a church that is biblically literate. And you've heard me say this, and I'm going to say it again, because after I've said it about 60 hundred times, 60 hundred, you like that? Yeah. That's 6,000. Uh, and you're sick of me saying it, and you're going, will he please stop saying that? Somebody is hearing it for the first time. When you read the Bible, let it read you. Be vulnerable. A lot of that you will discover amazing goodness. Sometimes there'll be some little stings, but not to hurt us, but to let us know where there's an area of our lives that we need to be addressed. Its purpose is not to harm us. Its purpose is to prosper us in the thing that matters most, and that is relationship with God. This one is not in your notes, so don't look for this on the screen. It's not in PowerPoint. This is the reason we've got to be careful about Goosebump God and why Goosebump God is a false God. 
Jeremiah 17, 9, and I'm reading this from the uh, NIV translation. The heart is deceitful above all things and beyond cure. Who can understand it? Ever found yourself making a decision based on your emotions at the moment and the thing that you said after it was all said and done is, well, that could have gone better. Yeah. Oh, yeah. We've all been there. Not a good plan. You've got to be careful about leading with the heart because you can walk into real dangerous territory. Amen? Amen. 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 If you don't hear me say anything else today, this one thing, if you don't walk away with anything else, this is why we are all here. We exist to trust and worship him. That's why we exist. He does not exist for us. He loves us so much that he created us and keeps us as close as we will let him. But we exist to trust and worship him. If you don't hear anything else I say today, hear that one. Got it? Okay. We risk confusion and misdirection when we make decisions, choices, and order our faith based solely on feelings and emotions. We're missing so much when we depend exclusively upon those. He gave us a brain, too. And he gave it to us on purpose, for a purpose, and we need to utilize that also. So here's another thing I want you to hang on to. If you don't always feel God's presence, you are not alone. First of all, other people have gone through this. Other people have been in the valley, in the ditch, with Tom's ditch water in there. <laughs> been there, done that, bought the t-shirt, sold it at the yard sale. Here's Psalm 88, verses 13 and 14 from the NLT. But I cry to you for help, Lord. In the morning, my prayer comes before you. Why, Lord, do you reject me and hide your face from me? Where is that psalm writer at? It's in God's word. It happens. It's real. It doesn't have to be permanent, and it does not have to be eternal. There are plenty of other examples. There are, there are many in the Psalms that were written by David himself. David talks about when he was in the valley of the shadow of death. He was anointed king. And then Saul went flat out crazy, tried to hunt him down and kill him. It was a great time for, for David. He was having a grand, grand blast hiding in caves and running for his life. Great time. Uh, no less a light in the New Testament than Paul, who wrote a substantial portion of the New Testament. He was given a vision of heaven that he couldn't even describe. He refers to it as the third heaven. He couldn't, he couldn't even go there. He was overwhelmed by it. And so as soon as he went and had his road to Damascus experience where God blinded him, and gave him his sight back, he immediately went out and started preaching, right? No. He spent three years wandering. He spent 14 years in obscurity making tents before he really launched his ministry. You want the ultimate example? Do you? Jesus. He had a moment on the cross where he says, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? At that, and, you know, most, uh, most theologians, and, and I happen to agree with this approach, uh, say that that was the moment in which he took on all of our sins. Not just the ones of us here in the room, but all of mankind from the first man from Adam all the way to the as yet unborn generations. He took it all. And in that moment, he was sin. God can't have any contact with sin. God averted his eyes from his own son so that his perfect plan could transpire. And he died for us. He died for you. He died for me. He experienced 
that awful loneliness, that terrible sense of disconnection. You all know how that worked out, right? About, you know, three days later, resurrected. Not some kind of weird, you know, zombie resurrection of the undead thing, but really, truly, completely alive, just like you and I right now. Ascended into heaven, sits at the right hand of the Father, prays as an accessory prayer warrior for you and I every day. Huh, that's the God I serve. Amen. Amen. C.S. Lewis wrote some stuff, and if you know C.S. Lewis, he was a he was a remarkable writer in the 20th century, uh, and a a remarkably faithful Christian. Most people only know him from Chronicles of Narnia. But he wrote many, many books, uh, and he's, he is good reads. He is good reads. I recommend him highly. During one of the most painful times in his life, he cried out, and I'm quoting here, a door slammed in my face, a sound of bolting and double bolting on the inside. After that, silence, unquote. C.S. Lewis, Chronicles of Narnia, dude. It made him doubt God's existence. He went through some horrible times when he lost his wife. It tore him apart. This is another quote from C.S. Lewis. There are no lights in the windows. It might be an empty house. You think he was in the valley? Think he'd found the ditch? Think he found the ditch water? You better believe it. You better believe it. He's wondering, was this house that I've believed in the occupant ever inhabited? It seemed so once. You know, the, the, the extraordinary flush when we make a decision that we're going to follow and obey Jesus the rest of our lives. And I say it that particular way because uh, Pastor Steve said something on Monday that just really spoke to me. It is so common in our culture today to hear people say, I accepted Jesus as my Lord and Savior. I fell in love with him. Um, he received me into his heart. All of these very, very emotional things. Lots of feels in them because people are starving for positive emotional reinforcement. And so that's crept into our culture more and more over the last 150 years. It's not biblical. Jesus explained it super simple. He said, if you obey me, if you, if you love me, rather, I'm sorry, if you love me, you will obey my commands. If you love me, you will obey my commands. That's the process through which we fall in love with him is obedience and worship because that's the only relationship we can have with an eternal God that made us, the creator. We are the created. It's the only way it can be done. No other options. Well, we got to keep moving, so I'm going to keep moving. Why is God so present and in command in our time of prosperity and so very absent in help during a time of trouble? If you don't feel God, you're not alone. There are three possibles that we're going to explore. Now, it is possible that these possibles might make the hair on the back of your neck rise up. It's probably an emotional response, but it's probably because you're going to get mad at me because what if I'm suggesting. But as I have said before, I love every single one of you, and I mean that in the most godly fashion, but it is not my job to make you happy. Amen. It is my job to equip you for works of service so that we are ready to help others who desperately need Jesus, right? Amen. Okay, then. So why don't we always feel God? Number one, maybe we are over sensationalizing, sensationalizing it. You try saying that three times fast. <laughs> no, I didn't mean it literally. Maybe we are over sensationalizing it. Maybe we're all about the concert experience and not about the waiting in line for the concert experience. Let's look at... In the book of John, chapter 6, verses 30 and 31. This is folks talking to Jesus, and they say this. 
people responded. They answered, show us a miraculous sign if you want us to believe in you. What can you do? After all, our ancestors ate manna while they journeyed through the wilderness. The scriptures say Moses gave them bread from heaven to eat. What's wrong here? Well, that is true. God gave them the bread, not Moses. But here's what's really wrong with that. What they are looking for is a show and tell God. You show me your God, and then I'll tell people about you. That doesn't require a relationship. All that requires is a dancing bear. That doesn't require relationship, and that's what he is interested in. And just, just so you know, mark this down. You might want to make a little note. Whatever God is interested in is what we should be interested in. You want to have a better relationship with God? Get interested in what he's interested in. You want to have a closer relationship with God? Experience joy about things he experiences joy about and grieve the things that grieve his heart. If you want to get closer to him, try that. These are people that want an angel on the street corner with one of those spinning signs, the spinning arrows for pizza or income tax preparation or something like that. They're looking for this, the angel with the spitting sign to point them in the right direction. Sometimes we might feel God if we always, and if we always felt him, what might be missing? What essential ingredient would be missing if we could just depend on the feels? It's another F word. Faith. We have lots of faith on the mountaintop. The real test of our faith is when we're not on the mountaintop. The, the real test of faith is when we just found ourselves in the rock slide into the valley. There's our real test. Second one, maybe our heart has hardened. Told you you get, might get mad at me. Maybe our heart has hardened. Have you ever had a hard heart towards somebody? You think it is impossible for you to experience a hard heart towards God? You know that it's possible because you know people who demonstrate it. You've seen it. There's no shortage of it in any population anywhere of people whose hearts are hardened to the creator of the universe. Matthew 13, 14 and 15. Check this out. This fulfills the prophecy of Isaiah that says, this is Jesus talking, when you hear what I say, you will not understand. When you see what I do, you will not comprehend. For the hearts of these people are hardened, and their ears cannot hear, and they have closed their eyes, so their eyes cannot see, and their ears cannot hear, and their hearts cannot understand, and they cannot turn to me and let me heal him. Is a hardened heart possible? Yes, sirree. It sure is. It absolutely is. This is not condemnation from Jesus. This is conviction. He's giving us a warning of what a hardened heart looks like. And he's basically telling us, this is the description. Avoid this. It's that simple. Sin separates us from God. We all understand that, right? There's all kinds of sin. There's envy, there's lying, there's gluttony, there's laziness, there's gossip. And then there's what most people think of as the serious sins, you know, adultery and porn and things like that. How does God see all of that? Same, same. God bless you. I hear those voices. Sin is sin, is sin, is sin. There's no big ones. There's no little ones. That's not the question. Here's the question. Is there a sin in our lives that we've gotten comfortable with? Told you we're not going to be happy with me. Is there a sin that you or I have gotten comfy with? Just all settled into it. Just, just right down in the ooze. Well, it doesn't smell like the ditch water. 
but it'll leave you in the ditch water. Count on it. When we're covered with sin, we can't feel God. It's the equivalent if you put on, in the dead of winter, probably not so much today. If in the dead of winter you put on full set of long johns and heavy woolen pants, a flannel shirt, um, the, the battery-powered boots with the little heaters in them, <laughs> yeah, two pairs of socks, one of those, one of those big goose-down coats that's all bubbly and everything and looks like it inflated on you. Then you put on a, a baklava ski mask, and, and then you put on uh, your, your earmuffs, and you put a hat on and over that. And When you go out in the cold, are you going to feel the cold? No, you're insulated from it. You're insulated. We can insulate ourselves from God with sin in our lives. We can do that. We absolutely can. At times in our life, we do. How do we deal with that? Well, I'm, I'm trying to do all the right things. I, I stopped looking at porn. Uh, I go to church. I serve. I tithe. I'm in a Thrive group. I'm, I'm checking all the boxes. Is that about his presence or is that about my performance? I'm going to go as far as to say I don't know the answer to that question. That's a question you have to answer for yourself. That's when it's time to look inward and ask yourself the hard question. Am I just trying to check the boxes? Or I am doing, or is my heart in the place where I'm doing this because I'm actively pursuing God? I'm running after Him like crazy. And that motivates everything that I do. And everything includes everything. There's the question to answer. I'm not going to say automatically that it's performance. I'm not going to say it's automatically you running after God's presence. I want you to think about what you're doing and make that decision for yourself and then decide if you're right where you should be or if it's time to make a change. Number three, maybe God wants to draw you closer. Maybe God wants us closer than we are. He hasn't moved. We have. He's still there. This is Paul. He's preaching in Athens. This is in Acts 17, 24 through 27. He is the God who made the world and everything in it. Since he is Lord of heaven and earth, he doesn't live in man-made temples, and human hands can't serve his needs, for he has no needs. He himself gives life and breath to everything, and he satisfies every need. From one man, he created all the nations throughout the whole earth. He decided beforehand when they should rise and fall. He determined their boundaries. His purpose was for the nations to seek after God and perhaps, perhaps feel their way toward him and find him, though he is not far away from any of us. Absence, we were told, makes the heart grow fonder. If you're struggling with a sense of the absence of God in your life, pursue Him fondly. Pursue Him with a heart that desires Him greatly. If we fear losing something that we value, it makes us want it even more. If you have concerns that you're losing your relationship with God, pursue Him energetically. Well, how often have you discovered that challenges, hard times, and suffering actually ends up producing the best in your life? It produces fruit in your life because you went through the valley. How come comfort, ease, and prosperity sometimes can bring out the worst in us? We're the most comfortable, wealthiest society on earth. And other countries are now sending missionaries to America. It's been flipped. The script has been flipped. Deprivation draws out desire. If I don't eat, 
I get hungry. If I don't drink, I get thirsty. If I don't feel God, I need to want him more. Emptiness should make me ask. Desperation should make me seek. Silence should make me knock. God wants to be pursued. He wants us to run after him with everything we've got. He has earned it, after all. He did pay the highest price. He did everything that he had to do for us. Everything. Just because God is silent, this is where the heart needs to engage the head. Just because at a moment in your life God is silent does not mean he's absent. They are not the same. They are not the same. Just because you don't feel him doesn't mean he's not there anymore. He is always there. That's not the question. The question is, where am I? Don't believe everything you feel. Don't believe everything you feel. Did I say, don't believe everything you feel? Thank you. Write this down if you've got a spot and you're writing, you're writing good old-fashioned notes. Feelings aren't facts. Feelings aren't facts. Make a note of that. Make it a part of our daily lives. It's a good thing to have. I need to wrap up. I'm going to share a verse that I know that some people value highly. For many people, this is a life verse because this is the verse that carries you through carries you through the valley. It is Jeremiah 29, 11. And it says, For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans to prosper you, not to harm you. Plans to give you hope and a future. I know people that live by that verse. They hang on to it with everything they've got. And I honor that. There's nothing wrong with that. But we make a critical error if we don't keep moving forward in Jeremiah 29 to verses, I think it's 12 and 13. Yeah. Then you will call on me and I will come and, pr and come and pray to me and I will listen to you. You will seek me, here it is, you will seek me and find me when you seek me with all your heart. Half-hearted won't get you there. If you're driving to uh, Miami and you've got a quarter tank of gas, you better stop and fill up. And then somewhere in South Carolina, you better stop and fill up again, at least if you drive like I do. <laughs> Just ask Pastor Mike about that sometime. He'll tell you. <laughs> you didn't have to agree that quickly, brother. This is not in your notes. But this is something you will hear pastors use this verse for their calling. Pastor Steve has used it as part of his. And it is increasingly part of mine. Jeremiah, once again, the weeping prophet who gets to deliver all the bad news about the Babylonian captivity. Jeremiah 20, verse 9. His word burns in my heart like a fire. It's like fire in my bones. I am worn out trying to hold it in. I can't do it. That is where he hungers for us to be. That's what he wants for us. You want to know what the best is? There it is. The God that wants the best for you wants that for you. For his word to burn in our hearts like a fire, like it is shut up in our bones, like we, can, we can't even hold it in. It doesn't mean we've got to be crazy and go find ourselves an apple box and go stand on a street corner and preach. You can do that if you're called to it. It means that we've got to love people where they're at and not where we think they should be. Because once upon a time, that was us. You may experience them occasionally. Goosebumps, tingly, tears, 
God is with us always. Ordinary, everyday, simple moments. I strive every single day to say to my gal, my bride in the morning, I'm going to be good to you today. And it puts an appropriate, healthy burden in my heart every single day to make sure that I mind my words, that I mind my temper, that I don't get stupid, that I don't let my heart just drive the bus. I want my heart on the bus, but not in the driver's seat. Every day, I'm going to be good to you today. I'm doing what I'm made to do. I can see the glory of God in an amazing sunrise or the astonishing cloud formations that we saw while uh, Tropical Storm Debbie was going by. And if you stopped for a moment and looked at them, you know exactly what I'm talking about. God is present. And when we draw closer to Him, He draws closer to us. Pray with me. Thank you, God, for being there even when it appears that you are absent. That's just us not seeing things clearly. Father, we ask for the privilege and the opportunity to see things more clearly. Help us see you. As we read your word, Father, speak to us. Read us. Encourage us on the things where we are pleasing you. Convict us in the places where we're missing the mark. We want to hit the target every time, Father. We know that we're not capable of that in this life. But we desire to hit that target every time. And that target is to always be closer to you, regardless of circumstances. To be closer to you, whether we're on the mountaintop. To be closer to you, whether we're in the valley, in the ditch with the ditch water because the time that I need you Lord is always and always means always I love you Father we love you we thank you for hearing our thoughts and our prayers and encourage us and give us opportunities to sense your response but not only through our emotions but through the fact that we've decided first in the midst of all of it, that we're going to trust you. That in the midst of all of it, we're going to worship you, regardless of what's going on. Instead, we're going to trust you and worship you because of what's going on. You're a mighty God. And you made us your children. You made us family. You made us heirs. Thank you for that incredible gift. We honor you and we love you, Lord. We thank you for everything that you're about to do in our lives. And all God's people said together, amen.